I am honored and appreciative to have taken part in this gathering. I thank these artists for their permission to discuss and interpret their work through the lens of this topic. Each artist uses photomechanical processing to intensify the content of their work. With each piece, I will focus upon one specific aspect. This presentation draws primarily upon the artworks themselves and insights shared by the artists while referencing a select few texts. When the poet Wisława Szymborska spoke of that rare miracle when a translation stops being a translation and becomes a second original, she was referring to the translation of a resolved artwork into a new language. But translation is also a process. These artists use prosaic photomechanical tools to transform content source into a poetic original. To quote Phil Zimmerman, Delirium is a book born of the COVID-19 pandemic. The text uses a paragraph from Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The strangely prophetic text is quoted and used as the narrative line. Highly manipulated images of jewel-like approximations of the coronavirus appeared on the web in the first few months of the pandemic and serve as the illustrations." End quote. In Making Delirium, Phil Zimmerman draws on his long history of working with color separations. In 1980, he edited Options for Color Separation. In the foreword, he writes, the aim of this book is not accurate color reproduction. The techniques described herein are on the whole interpretive rather than reproductive. His artistic career has been devoted to the creative and expressive use of CMYK separations, converting them with different halftone patterns and swapping colors. In his hands, the prosaic halftone pattern and generic process colors become poetic tools. In The Art of Syntax, poet Ellen Bryant Voigt writes, reading anything at all employs reliance on deeply learned patterns which are either fulfilled or resisted. Voigt explores poetic syntax in the context of Chomsky's deep and surface linguistic structures. In Delirium, the halftone unit is the deep structure, and the processing and rearrangement of imagery and text is the surface structure. Quoting Voigt, Syntactic patterns or surface structures are efficient delivery systems for often complicated discursive information. The human brain is avid for pattern by which to register, store, and retrieve information. And parallelism is one of the more common. In delirium, parallels are formed between the virus and the halftone by giving equal visual significance to each. The bookwork unfolds in a rich sequential variation of color, scale, and pattern, always connected by the fundamental unit of the halftone that creates a visual net for images of the invasive virus. Images are gathered, taken apart, then reassembled and layered with text. This recreation, generated by prosaic visual tools, creates a hallucinatory poetic world. The choice to collapse all the components into a single printed surface brings coherence. When experiencing delirium, I'm also reminded of our optical structure. The retina is behind the venous system. We see through the latticework of veins. Our brain fills in the gaps, builds the image, and then creates sense. We are pattern seekers, but also lulled by and glaze over repeated pattern. All this to explain the invisibility of the halftone pattern when at a small scale. But what happens when expectation of how the halftone unit is used is disrupted? In delirium, the point is to see the minuscule as a magnified entity. The visual tools have been intensified. The halftone patterns and their ascribed colors are vibrant and even destabilizing. Phil Zimmerman has consistently woven imagery and text in response to issues related to perilous conditions of our world and social structures. In Delirium, the magnification of the halftone parallels a microscopic examination of the expanding world of viruses. It also implies viewing distance and the pandemic reality of life viewed through a screen world. 
The format and scale of delirium are immersive. We are pressed up against the page, flattened against the shallow space of color, form, words. When viewed from this perspective, the meaning of each element is clear, but the context is disorienting. This is a visually poetic recreation that makes visual sense of a nonsensical period. In his colophon, Cliff Meadow writes, all of the images in this work were downloaded from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. This cultural gift was a panacea during the pandemic. From his statement, I imagined this project as a museum catalog gone completely wrong. Reproductions mangled, images misregistered. I imagined that in this catalog, all text would be removed. The reader would be left to construct their own narrative from this unreal evidence. And this is what I will undertake, with attention on the role of selective focus and registration. We start with the flickering representation of the 1602 charter of the VOC. We experience disparate visual elements with unfixed borders. VOC is a travelogue of sorts, through time, through societal values, made in a contemporary time when travel was forbidden. The tall, narrow format is resistant to handling. It is disobedient to opening, to revealing what happens in the gutter. This is not a comfortable journey. Our field of vision is filled by suggestive symbols of travel, power, and luxury. The objects move and shift, paralleling wandering thoughts. The images slide across the sloping angle of pages and fall into the gutter, trapping the trappings of power, mapping the trail of greed. We seek a place of focus as the multiple layers rotate. Beautiful forms hover over empty white space or are absorbed into shadows. We become groundless, unfixed, except for our fixation on acquisition. In VOC, we are reminded of how vision really functions. We see in small areas of focus, surrounded by peripheral blur, but we create a focused composite in our mind. Our filtering out of this process echoes our capacity to overlook the impact of our individual and communal voraciousness. Cliff Matter's choice to disrupt the expectation of seamless registration when representing objects and layering disparate images emphasizes that constructs are just that, not truth, not inevitable, but a choice, much like our individual and social focus on material and monetary gain. Here we see a sample of Cliff Matter's process of separations and their relative colors. His skill as a printer creates the following image. The skins of ink form a portrait of the appearance of power, the posture of assurance. All layers are perfectly registered and clearly focused at the eye on the goal. In his article, Content Exhaustion, Richard Sewell writes, registration is not just a logistical issue, it is an aesthetic issue, end quote. Each step of the print process is a creative act rather than a predictable function. And central to Cliff Metter's process in making VOC is a willfully disruptive strategy. And what makes this use of registration a subversive poetic expression? In text and music, we are accustomed to the suspension of comprehension, but in visual forms, we expect the coalesced image. And when this is withheld, we are challenged. We experience incomprehension, we lose our place. And in a piece where the artist wonders, quote, about the real cost of wealth, this is fitting. VOC is a work of dreadful beauty. The images are alluring, shimmering, and horrible. This parallels the difficult to reconcile reality that, quoting from the colophon, at the same time the VOC was becoming a force for terror, the Dutch Republic was a haven for liberal thinking. This long distance collaboration was made during the pandemic. Both Julie Chen and Carrie Michelani Schroeder create artist books that are highly interactive, sculptural, and often challenge the convention of the codex. 
The historical binding format for Book of Hours is known as a blow book, designed as a magic trick. The artists have used this sleight of hand to nest 12 distinct sections into one piece. Book of Hours is two-sided, ante and post-meridium, with six sequences apiece unfolding over the course of each side. The first and last sequences on each side were designed collaboratively. The other eight are individual creations. This piece requires very focused attention when handling. We are ever aware of the physical nature of the paper and binding. The fifth sequence at bottom left is Carrie's photographs of her hand stretching towards those of family and friends. The images of ever reaching hands speak not only of separation, but of the significance of the handmade and the tactile nature of Book of Hours. This image provides another glimpse into the rich range of graphic approaches and print processes employed in creating this work. The diversity of imagery and text parallel their range of poetic musings about the nature of time. The third section of each side contains Julie Chen's pressure printed portraits. On the left is Barb Tettenbaum, who introduced Julie to this print method, and on the right is Carrie Schroeder. Julie invited family and friends to send her self-portraits. In anti-meridium, the portraits are unmasked. In post-meridium, the portraits are masked. These images speak of correspondence and exchange in a time of physical absence. The photographic source images were turned into grayscale, posterized into three tones, and then a digital line drawing was generated to guide the laser cutting of the respective tonal shapes that were collaged together to create the print matrix. Julie relates how a crucial and unexpected part of this process was the time she was able to spend with each person's portrait as she carefully separated the tonal sections, gazing closely at their image when physical proximity was not possible. This slide demonstrates the transformational effect of making a pressure print. On the left is the smooth, seamless tonal key. On the right, the pressure print reveals the artifacts of printing. Pressure printing is, in essence, a form of make ready. The matrix is a shallow relief map attached to the press cylinder and then remains behind the paper as the paper is pressed against the ink slab on the press bed. The varying thicknesses of the matrix result in tonalities and produce the soft haloing effect. What is unique to this printing method is how the paper positions between plate and ink. The functional purpose of Make Ready to provide consistent printing has been subverted to create dissolving veils of tone. These portraits recall their photographic source, but convey more strongly the care-filled processing, the touch and tactility required to rebuild each person's likeness, the nature of the printing process. These elusively recognizable portraits are a distillation of light and shadow following the curves and forms of each face. The photographic transformed into a graphic representation of an absent body becomes a poetic embodiment of ink on paper created by the caring touch of the artist's hand. The camera was David Morris's primary tool for decades, making visual records of the natural world in search of stasis, creating images that arrest the process of transition from life to death. David is a collector with a fascination for the Wunderkammer, or Cabinet of Curiosity. This is a detail of one of his displays in our home. Photography provides him with the expressive medium that is simultaneously a record of suspended time and a form of collection. Here we see a small selection of the multitude of images he gathered for gaze. In museums throughout Italy, US, and Canada, David framed and recorded details of sculpted forms where the static object seems caught mid-gesture. The collecting stage is followed by the reflective process of editing starting the process of juxtapositions and contrasts, creating conversations between images. Additionally, David makes caring portraits of poorly done taxidermy, 
drawing on his own and other collections. David and I began our research into photogravure in 1993. We thank John Goodman for his generous sharing of skill and knowledge during our learning process. David approached photogravure informed by the convention of the photographic window, but he was motivated by the desire to create a printed photographic object. Photogravure was ideal for its unique balance of photographic and graphic language. The tangible nature of photogravure creates an object of substitution, a visual possession. Photography teaches us to select and sequence. Photogravure, like poetry, teaches us to edit. The intimate format of the book reinforces David's intentions in making gaze. These image objects of ink and paper are held in the hand and regarded with close attention to their subtle detail. The process creates visual and psychological equivalents. The pompous portrait and the deteriorating artifact become equally significant, equally worthy of attention and preservation. The formal beauty of photogravure is a beauty of tone and texture. Ink pressed into and resting on carefully selected paper surface has both tactile and visual allure. But the inked image, printed in multiple, also carries responsibility. What content are we disseminating into the world? The compulsion to collect raises questions about the problematic nature of trophies and reduction to an abject condition. But in David's work, the willingness to gaze lovingly at the unlovely is an exchange and an acceptance of mutual reality. The final spread, spread of gaze is particularly poignant. This work is an elegy. Gaze arose from the desire to collect, archive, organize, and display, but also to value. To value life and to preserve the fleeting moment and recognize the inherent ephemerality of all life. The land I am fortunate to live and work on is at the northwest shore of Lake Ontario, on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat people. In June 2020, I began to regularly photograph at the lake's edge. I would complete my walk by visually recording from the same vantage point. Where Steps Stop is a four-part work about the flux of water, sky, ground, and their visual convergence. While the camera and photographic language informs my work, I am fundamentally a print artist and find my work's resolution through layering. In addition to the physical strata of printmaking, I'm also seeking a means to layer the written word and musical references into my work. Ursula Le Guin wrote that Tao Te Ching is partly in prose, partly in verse, but as we define poetry now, not by rhyme and meter, but as the patterned intensity of language, the whole thing is poetry. The repetition of visual bands and structural patterning in word and tempo provides the framework for integrating disparate expressive forms. Le Guin asserts that her version of the Tao Te Ching is a rendition, not a translation. In making each component of where steps stop, I render a different multi-sensory experience of the place. In Surfaces Murmur, the sonic experience is layered over the visual record. Distinct layers of printing echo the layering of perception. We see the represented space through the filter of thought. The challenge was to use the printed word in such a way that image and word were balanced and that the visual presentation of the text would underscore its meaning. How can distinct layers of printing generate photographic and graphic realities that echo both the human presence and the natural world? After multiple attempts combining inkjet and letterpress, I turned to the CMYK process, building on earlier experiments into four-color photogravure. In this case, I construct the CMY digital print by building color layers and create a separate K layer that intensifies the texture and shadow of the image and integrates the phrases. 
The digital print and the gravure positive include registration marks, and I attach tabs and pins. The positive is registered to the plate during exposure, establishing the registration system. With polymer gravure, there is no expansion or contraction to the image from positive to plate. Coated inkjet IA paper is highly receptive to ink and permits dry printing. This results in a work where the digital pigment ink sinks into the paper surface and the gravure printing rests on top. A subtle veil hovers between the viewer and the environment. While the image information is carefully registered, minimizing the perception of layering, the physical difference of inkjet inks, paper, and intaglio ink magnify the separation of visual surfaces. This method allows for variation in the relative legibility or visual prominence of images and words, much like the way sound ebbs and flows at the lake's edge. Through the course of surfaces murmur, the human presence has been collecting but when the relentless urge to take finally abates, only the sounds of stone meeting water remain.